So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Paul Sethi, Vice President of the Board. President John Weed uh, will be attending remotely this evening and I will be uh, presiding over the meeting. So this is our regular monthly um, board meeting of the Alameda County Water District. And I would like the um, Secretary to take the, oh, I don't know. Mr. Stevenson, do you wanna go first? Oh yeah, we can call? go ahead and uh, call roll, yeah. yeah. So I would ask the district secretary to take the roll call. Director Zephi? Here. Akbari? Here. Gunther? Here. Wong? Here. And Weed? Here. Online. Mr. Stevenson, would you lead us in the salute to the flag? Of course. Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, for God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So before we go to public comments, I would like to ask the general manager to go through some procedural things for the meeting. Very good. Thank you, Vice President Sethi, and welcome everybody. On behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome the public's participation in this board meeting. My name is Ed Stevenson, and I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this board meeting either in person or remotely by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. Any member of the public present in person who wishes to make comments may approach the speaker's podium at the appropriate time. For those participating remotely, note that the meeting agenda, staff reports, and presentation materials are all available at the district's website at acwd.org. You may reference the instructions at the top of the agenda for how to participate using the controls in the Zoom app or your dial pad if participating by telephone audio. Again, thank you all for attending, and that completes my housekeeping remarks. Okay, at this time, we will move on to public comments. Members of the public may address the board on any issue not listed on the agenda, which are within the purview of the Alameda County Water District. Time limit will be, a five minute limit is customary. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled item will be given the opportunity to do so when that agenda item comes up. Are there any members of the public who would like to make any comments at this point? I'm looking at Zoom and our participant list on Zoom includes um, some members of staff, but also the Tri-City Voice. So if there's any uh, wish to make a comment, um, now would be a good time. You can raise your hand or speak up. I don't see any hands up, so uh, we'll move to item four, which is the consent calendar. Um, may I invite a board member to add items to the consent calendar? I'll make the motion to add items 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, and 5.5 .5 to the consent calendar. I will second. We have a motion and a second. Director Sethi? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. Is there a motion to accept the consent calendar as amended? I'll move consent calendar as amended. I'll second. Director Sethi? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. Okay, at this point, we will move to item 5.6, which is a resolution honoring Ricardo Vera upon his retirement from district service. And so I will turn this over to uh, Mr. Stevenson or another member of staff. Great. Thank you, Vice President Sethi. And, uh, you know, as these are always bittersweet, it is part of our job uh, to um, usher our retirees into their next phase of their journey. And uh, Rick Vera is here in attendance this evening in the boardroom with his wife. And it's fantastic to have him here, but it just makes it that much more difficult. Uh, to do items like this. Um, it's really, really tough 
when a member of the ACWD family leaves us, um, particularly one who's been here for a long time and is such a special person like Rick is. So these, these are always bittersweet. Um, but to kick off this item, I will turn it over to our Director of Operations and Maintenance, Kurt, uh, Kurt Ahrens. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Yes, as uh, Mr. Stevens said, it saddens me a lot, but it's a great honor to uh, recognize Rick Ricardo, he goes by Rick, for his over 26 years of service. Um, tonight, we just wanna recognize, and I think what's difficult and what's, uh, people miss is Rick's attitude. Over his 26 years, he's always, I think every day, had a very positive attitude, um, very friendly, very enthusiastic, always anxious to help. Um, I think that's really gonna be missed. A quick summary of Rick's background. He started here in 1996 as a utility worker, soon became a gardener, and then in 2007, transitioned to the facilities maintenance division where he's a facility maintenance worker. So just about everybody at facilities knows Rick. He's touched just about everybody. He's worked at just about every facility. You know, small projects, you know, if you need a whiteboard put up or something done to, you know, major renovations, renovated the kitchen while I've been here and numerous projects throughout the years. Always well, been very positive, very detail or oriented, um, has done excellent work and it's gonna be very hard to replace Rick. Um, all his, you know, coworkers, I think everybody here just appreciates his positive attitude. And tonight we just want to recognize, and the recommendation tonight is by motion to adopt a resolution honoring Rick Vera, Ricardo Vera, and expressing appreciation for over 26 years of dedicated service to the district. So with that, I'm sure uh, others might have something to add, but he will be missed. Thank you, Mr. Aarons, for those remarks. Um, could we go around the board with any May comments? I? Start with Director Wong. Thank you. So, Mr. Vera, it was actually really nice to chat with you right before the board meeting. As I have expressed, I am truly sorry that I didn't get, have the opportunity to get to know you much earlier. You're one of the many, many unsung heroes for ACWD. We walk into this room. we just assume that we will plug in our laptop, there will be power. We assume the door will work, the whiteboard will come, there will be a whiteboard, the screen will come down. You make that happen. I had a chat with Mr. Stevenson when I saw your retirement and asked him a little bit more about you know, the tasks that you perform here in ACWD. And he basically said, you make things work. <laughs> I think that pretty much summarized what he told me. That's truly appreciated. It's not something that people always recognize or remember until something does not work. Then they know to call you. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. It's your work that makes it so easy for our staff to serve our customers. Make it so easy for the board to hear to be here and discuss and perhaps discuss strenuously, um, like what happens sometimes. And as I was reviewing the packet, I realized you are the gentleman that designed that wonderful frame for our 4th of July parade. That was one of the most creatively designed thing I have seen. It was portable. It was really easy to disassemble. It made this engineer really, really happy. So that's a personal <laughs> thank you for actually designing that frame. I truly enjoy actually watching them putting it up and taking things down. So thank you. And a special thank you to your family. My understanding is that they definitely lend you to us for many, sometimes over time, long hours, just to make things work. Thank you. It's usually the family, without the family support, we couldn't have great staff like Mr. Vera. And Based on my discussion with Mr. Stevenson, I also understand that you're actually leaving another legacy beside your great work and everything that you have accomplished. I believe your son is working for us as an engineer. I'm actually really happy to see that the Vera family legacy will continue here at ACWD. Thank you for your service and thank you to your family. Um, thank you very much for your time and service here. Judy's correct. You know we tend to forget the people who make things work. And 
you know, we all have our, our functions and our staff and, and what we do. And, but we forget the computer doesn't turn on, the power doesn't come on, the water doesn't come out of the faucet in the bathroom, whichever it is. You know, some of these things are pretty minor. The desk in the office, you know, you need something put up there. Thank you for doing those things for so long, being here, even back to how does a facility look? Well, that's important. That's what our customers see. And you've made that happen now for quite a few years. And, you know, I, I retirements are always tough because I don't want to see people retire. And yet I'm so happy when they do. And it's not because they're retiring. I'm happy for them. And uh, enjoy your retirement. You deserve it. And, um, but, you know, what could I say? Enjoy it. You deserve it. Thank you. So, Rick, I'll, I'll add on to the comments here. You know, I, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know you um, during your service here, but it's very, um, it's very apparent that you are leaving a long legacy. And, and I'm so happy to hear that your family is joining us as well and, and that they're going to continue that legacy. Um, There's something that, that Kurt mentioned. It was that you're very detail-oriented. And in the role that you occupied, being detail-oriented makes the difference. That's what makes the difference between us being able to do what we do and not being able to do what we do. Um, and it's not just you um, helping, uh, you know, helping us do our work, but it's through that work that we can serve the community um, that, that we're uh, elected to serve in. And so I'm very, very excited for you. I'm very happy for uh, the work that you've put in, and it sounds like it'll be a well-deserved retirement. Um, there is a question I always like to ask anyone who's who's retiring, and that's, what are you most looking forward to in retirement? Wow. Well, that sounds incredible. Um, I mean, I hope I hope you get to really enjoy your time off. And uh, your lovely wife is with us tonight, too. And so I, I really hope you both get to enjoy the retirement. Uh, very well deserved. President Weed, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, I'll make them brief, given the uh, logistics here. But thank you for so much for your service. You've seen the transition as we've grown from... Uh, into our new facilities and made all of the uh, various changes over the years. And I've, I've added probably at least 100 people on staff in that period of time, which means that that may more, um, much support is required. So thank you and thank you and your wife for your services. And now that you're bringing, keeping it in the family, all the better. Thank you. Rick and, and Mrs. Vera, um, you know, I'm reminded of a, a an old traditional American saying that when you buy a home and when you sell it, you leave it in much better shape than when you first purchased it. And I think that this is what you have done for the district. You've left the district in much better shape than when you came in. And so I'm wishing both of you um, wonderful experiences in your retirement. And from what I understand, you have mentored quite a few people here in the district too. So that's a great part of your legacy. <clears throat> we have a, uh, a plaque we would like to present to you this evening, if I may come down. Uh, maybe we can oh, take action oh, yeah, on that first and then the signatures will make more sense. Can we also <laughs> see if Mr. Burra has any comments for us? Can we please? Yes, please come on up. Uh, I feel uh, I was privileged to have gotten a job here. Uh, I often have attended uh, 
what my life would have been if I hadn't gotten a job here. Uh, I often think that it wouldn't have been here. And having a job here, I'm able to provide for my family. Provide for my, uh, provide for my family. Had when I was young, paid me for my policy, college. My wife and I, we sacrificed. It wasn't always easy. Quite a few inside the building here. Um, my wife would bring me lunch, drop off, uh, drop off for breakfast. My family did it. I don't think I have here. I just don't know how I got. Project would be my wife and I. Like I said I always had the backing of my wife. Good gratitude. Ready to move on to the next phase of my life. Dad, when I leave, another thing that we could work here would be I had a positive attitude. Everybody was so nice, so professional, so encouraging. Advisor, everybody gave back. How many of you had to leave? I was super happy that my son got a job here. I didn't even know he wanted to be in here and wanted to go back to college. I think he probably wanted to be. <laughs> I never wanted to spot this thing. Got ready to got ready to I've never actually been here. That I said. Would I, a member of the board like to make a motion to approve I this will resolution? probably make the motion. And I'll second. Secretary. Director Sethi? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Wong? Aye. And Weed? Aye. Thank you. You think it, we could take a group photo with Mr. and Mrs. Vera down here? Absolutely. If they don't mind that. <laughs> yeah, you're not done yet, Rick. You gotta, it's photo time. <laughs> Do one.
Okay, uh, we'll move on to agenda item 5.7. This is a resolution authorizing the renewal of a line of credit for five years in an amount up to $10 million and approving the execution and delivery of certain documents in connection therewith. This was reviewed recently in the Finance Committee. And uh, may I ask Mr. Wunderlich to review this item for us, please? Sure, absolutely. Good evening, Vice President Seth, the members of the board and public. Uh, the district first established a $10 million emergency line of credit with its banking provider, JP Morgan, back in 2017. The line of credit does require annual renewals, and it has been renewed uh, each year through 2022. And so to maintain the line of credit into 2023 and beyond, it must be renewed again. And so following a competitive solicitation, staff does recommend renewing the emergency line of credit with JP Morgan, this time for a period of five years. So we would not be coming back each year uh, and kind of incurring those expenses uh, related with each time we do have to go through a renewal. Uh, there's adequate funding within the district's operating budget for these expenditures. And as Vice President Sethi mentioned, this was reviewed in committee a few weeks ago. Renewing the line of credit will assist in meeting the district strategic plan goal 1.3, continuously improve emergency preparedness and response capabilities. Uh, now, one feature of this uh, proposal from JP Morgan is that the line of credit has what we refer to as an accordion feature where it can be easily upsized up to 50 million. However, what the board is approving tonight is a 10 million line of credit and we would come back to the board for specific approval if we were to ever consider borrowing more than that. Additionally, in order for us to use the line of credit, there must be an emergency declared by the governor of uh, California. So it's not a situation where the district board can just determine that it's an emergency and use this line of credit. And that is a condition imposed by the bank as a part of establishing this. So the recommendation is by motion one, adopt a resolution, A, authorizing the renewal of an existing line of credit in an amount up to 10 million, B, making certain other findings in connection therewith, and C, approving the execution delivery of certain documents in connection therewith, and two, authorize the general manager to execute the second amended and restated revolving credit agreement with JP Morgan to renew the line of credit for the period of December 24, 2022 through December 23, 2027 for a total uh, cost inclusive of JP Morgan's legal fees that will be directly paid by the district not to exceed $260,000. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll open it up to the board for any questions, please. Nothing for me. I'm good. Okay. Uh, President Weed, any comments? Um, I had originally come up with this idea many years ago and strongly support. So am I. Um, President Weed and I originally suggested this uh, quite a number of years ago back, and we were working on uh, a short-term line of credit. I think two years was was it? Uh, so it's been one year each one year, year, and we've had to renew it each year. Yeah. So what we're doing now is to increase the line of credit for a period of five years, which I think is reasonable. Um, with, uh, are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment on this item? I don't see any hands raised. So um, I'll, I'll actually move this item myself. Um, for approval on the on the staff's recommendation. I'd like to I'll second. second. Okay. So John seconding it? Okay. I, well, I, I can defer. Director Sethi. Director Sethi makes the motion. Uh, Director Arpari made the uh, second. So Director Sethi? Aye. Akbari? Aye. Wong? Aye. Gunther? Aye. And Weed? Aye. 
Okay, we will move on to um, board committee reports. Are there uh, any comments or questions on reports? Okay, I have one. I'm not sure which committee this was on, but it was in the board packet around page 260 or something. It is the progress on the AMI rollout. Uh, yes, and in fact, in item 6.2, quarterly projects review, that's where we'll actually um, talk about that a little bit. Okay. But we'll be happy to I, talk about it I now, I would too. like to understand what's on this uh, sure. map. Sure. Um, yeah, that was the Engineering and Technology Committee, um, and the map is in the board packet, but I will toss it over to our Director of Engineering and Technology, Mr. Wolk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening, board members and uh, community members. <clears throat> um, yes, as uh, Vice President said, he indicated this is a map that the board has not seen before. It came out of uh, one of our engineering and IT committee presentations. The committee indicated that it would be good to have a map that shows the progress on the AMI uh, project. And so we got that input from the committee. We took this we took a crack at it and took this map back to the committee um, in October. And based on their feedback, which I, I'm really grateful for, uh, we developed a, a way to show progress on a quarterly basis on this particular project. Um, and if I could walk you through, and it's up on the screen, if I could walk you through how this map works, um, it's um, what the numbers you see are the reading routes for our uh, meters. And then the different colors indicate whether or not that um, reading route or that section of the service area has been completed or is, is it it's in progress or uh, will happen within the next three, six or um, 12 to 18 months. So it is a graphic way of uh, presenting this information to the board and hopefully uh, we will continue doing this. But uh, one thing that we will uh, improving the next report is that based on the committee's feedback, we will modify the colors to make them more user friendly and and uh, help the audience understand um, um, where in, uh, improvements are being made. So that's one thing that you will see in the near future. Other than that, I um, I'll be more than happy to to answer any questions you may have. And, and again, I want to thank the committee members for their guidance on putting this together. Thank you, Mr. Awoke. If I could make a recommendation to our staff, I think it would be helpful to have on here the target number of AMI installations that we are um, intending to make, and then um, <clears throat> what percent of that has been completed. I'd like to see a com uh, percentage breakdown, complete, in progress, you know, by your different color schematics here. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at that, thank you. I think that would be helpful, not only to us as directors, but to the any members of the public that are looking at this. I also wanted to ask, um, are we getting any feedback from customers on the AMI rollout? Um, the, the feedback we typically get is people inquiring when they would get their smart meter. So they have seen either, um, you know, information on social media or they've seen one of our um, um, Aqueduct newsletters and they reach out to us or the, the um, email address for the project. They reach out to us wondering when they would get their meter. So that's that's most of the inquiries I have seen. Uh, there are special cases where uh, during the, the installation process, the, the customer would reach out to us to uh, see if we can maybe fix some of the problems they have behind the meter. And we would advise them accordingly whether or not that's something that we could do or or that, would, uh, that it would be their responsibility. So those are the types of uh, outreach we've received. Have we received any positive feedback in terms of um, people using uh, their smartphone or computer to access information, or have we received any complaints? 
um, we most of the feedback we've gotten is positive and and we are in the near future when we roll out the the customer portal i think that's when we will we will expect to see uh a lot more feedback but the general feedback that we've received is people are very excited about uh, the opportunity to have access into their water usage information yeah, so as it stands right now, we haven't rolled out the customer portal yet, and that's where the real value to the customer is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually getting very close to doing that, and we're planning on uh, providing some information to the board about that and, uh, and a demo of the portal in an upcoming board meeting. So um, once the portal's released, um, then I expect we'll receive more input about how well it's working and customers' experience with the portal. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any other board comments or questions? I think I'll, I'll just add the, the only other feedback that I had provided to um, during, during the committee meeting was maybe uh, messing with the colors a little bit. So it's a little bit easier to read, but otherwise um, this was a request that uh, both, um, both Jim and I had for uh, during the committee. And so I just appreciate um, the team being responsive to that request. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, this is, as Mr. Awoke points out, um, this is the first version, and so this is the same version that the committee saw. We haven't made those changes yet um, in terms of requested, you know, enhancements, but um, we will be including this in the board packet in the quarterly projects review, and you'll always have access to it there, and we'll incorporate those requested improvements um, at the next version. Okay, great. Um, We'll move on to item 6.2, operational reports. Any comments or questions? Not seeing any, not seeing any from the public. So we will move on to a staff presentation. And uh, that's item 6.3. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Nizar. All right. Yeah, it's all you. This is something a little bit new and different for the board, uh, but, you know, we like to keep it spicy. So uh, Thomas is here to kick off this item. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, actually, I'm going to kick it over to Ms. Heidis to uh, give it a little introduction for us for this evening. Great. Thank you, Mr. Neiser. Um, so staff's pleased to be here tonight to share with the board and the public a presentation and a short interactive exercise in advance of our next water resources planning workshop. So next slide, please. We'll, we will be um, briefly reviewing what the workshop series is about, share why we're doing tonight's exercise and how the information will be used. And then we'll review existing planning objectives and jump into the exercise. Uh, the exercise is designed to gather the board's input, but we also welcome members of the public to participate in the thought exercise if they wish. And we'll provide details on how to do so when we get to that point in the presentation. Next slide, please. This is a list of acronyms we may be using during the workshop series, and we won't be reviewing in detail, but it's included for quick reference. And next slide. Uh, as a reminder, we plan to hold a series of workshops this year and next year to focus on planning for long-term management of the district's water resources in the face of many uncertainties and challenges ahead, as you see on the slide, using an integrated planning approach. Last month, we provided a briefing on the district's draft climate adaptation plan. Tonight, we'll be delving into planning objectives and scoping efforts for our 2025 master plan. And now to get that started, I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Thomas Neiser, the district's water supply and uh, planning manager to get us going. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great, well, this would be a fun evening, I hope. Um, so as, as Laura mentioned, this is really building up towards digging into updating our water supply master plan. And uh, I think I introduced last time I was up here, we're gonna use the term kind of generic water supply master plan. IRP integrated plan is a type of a water supply master plan. It's the one we used last time, but until we're officially down the path, we're kind of making it generic. So if it's confusing, um, please let me know. A broad overview of what an integrated planning process looks like, assuming we're going down that path again is, process which begins by defining goals and objectives, and that's what we'll be doing in the coming year. Uh, identifying uh, key participants and stakeholders in the community, which actually helps us with establishing objectives for the study. 
identifying critical issues or gaps in, in our existing uh, system. And after completing a plan, that implementation process really needs to trickle through the whole district and, and all planning processes need to be referential to the IRP. This is something that ACWD has done very well over the past 30 years. And then the last part is, is supposed to be a living plan, unlike a lot of traditional plans, which is sort of set a course and uh, you know lash the rudder down and go take a nap and hope you land in Hawaii. Uh, you're supposed to be checking where you're going and, and making adjustments along the way. And so monitoring, evaluating, and adapting the plan as conditions change uh, is another key thing that the district here has done as quite exemplary compared to a lot of our own neighboring agencies, frankly. We'll talk about that, I think, next week a little bit. Um, but we really wanted to just take the time and talk about that first step of, of establishing objectives. Um, and this are really what are the needs uh, and the, the metrics that are going to be used to develop a new plan. Um, so we want to do an exercise tonight that's really just kind of really trying to get the juices flowing, get the board in the mindset of thinking about what are those trade offs um, when we get into a um, into developing a plan. The the idea is uh, we want to get a little bit of a poll tonight from the board to sort of feel where we are, uh, what the board sentiment is. And one, you might think of this as being a little bit like before you start a diet plan, you might hop on the scale and write down your weight and take your blood pressure and get a few metrics down. And then you go in about your plan and, and you see where you go from there. This is kind of like that, but it's really um, not terribly consequential in terms of deriving anything. So how will this information be used? It's strictly going to be informational. Okay, so this nothing here done tonight is intended to give direction to staff or inform decision making. So it's inconsequential in terms of how we will be using it. Um, it's really uh, going to help set us up for some nice discussions, I believe, on the 16th as we start digging into uh, water supply master planning. So before we begin, I uh, thought we'd start by reviewing um, our history of, of planning objectives here at the Water District using the, our current plan, the 1995 IRP. And as a reminder, this was this slide that came from the 2019 workshops when we covered a lot of this material. Um, but to review, what were those objectives used by ACWD and by your predecessors in the 1990s? Uh, categorically cost, reliability, water quality, environmental impacts, local control and risk. And we'll di dive into these just in more detail in just a moment. Um, once objectives were established for a plan, uh, we need to weight those objectives and decide which ones we think are the drivers, which are the ones that are the most important for us, if any. Um, because when we get into developing a portfolio, which is what an integrated plan is, we have to bring in a balance of ideas uh, there's going to be trade-offs in between the options, and there have to be compromises along the way. Uh, the classic example we like to say is cost and reliability. We could build a 100% reliable water supply portfolio, uh, but at an astronomical cost. And by relying on stakeholder input, we get a sense of what is the willingness to pay for what level of reliability. And right there, just between those two, you can see that the very easy understanding of what a compromise and a trade-off might look like. Overall, the goal will be to optimize as many of these things as possible. In 1995, these were established as the, the key criteria we wanted, to, we wanted to do well in all of these. We didn't want any of them to, to be um, uh, at deficit, uh, but acknowledging that one would have to win out over another one. So how are these objectives used? Uh, well, first, we'll do a needs assessment. Uh, we, we use those objectives to look at our own portfolio and figure out where, where we maybe have some holes, what, what a gap assessment might say. And then uh, we use it as a framework to evaluate new resources. So this board has seen this in application. We've looked at business cases for uh, Delta Conveyance, for Los Vaqueros, for recycled water concepts. All of those have presented these objectives to the board to just show how those uh, projects rank in terms of meeting the board established objectives. And they therefore will be used to support decision making. 
Okay, so I'd like to just kind of go through each of the objectives from the 1995 IRP before we jump into the exercise. So the first one, and these are in no order of priority or not even alphabet, uh, cost, this is just how it's listed in the IRP. So I'm just bringing it straight out of the 1995 IRP. So cost was uh, the first one listed. The, uh, the All of these will list the objective, the policy objective established by the board. What are we trying to achieve? And then the criteria, how is this evaluated? And then a little bit of detail. So in the, in the front of cost, we wanted to try and minimize total resource cost, keep prices low uh, with an objective uh, of maintaining low average customer bills. Um, and one uh, a tertiary is avoid rate shock. So this sort of gets into some of the applications. So when I talk about the implementing IRP planning throughout the district, the financial planning philosophy includes avoiding rate shock. We don't want to have sudden rate increases. Uh, we This one is quite simply covered as a net present value type analysis. And by that, we look at any scenario considers the long-term operating costs in addition to capital costs to figure out what portfolio of water supplies works the best for ACWD from a cost perspective when brought back to the present value. Next was reliability. This is, most people put this right at the top of a water supply plan. So the objective of reliability was the district wanted to maintain a high level of service with the criteria being what, what's the best we can do during a drought, unmet demand during a drought. So how big of a shortfall would we have in a drought year? Happened to be in a drought year, it's very conducive to thinking about it. Uh, the detail from 20, uh, excuse me, 1995 was to not exceed a 10% shortfall and not to have a 10% shortfall even in more than once in 30 years, which kind of worked with the historic hydrology. We had a critical drought in the 20s. We had a pretty bad year in the 50s and uh, the 1970s in single critical years. And that, that was sort of conducive to this return period. So that's what went into establishing that criteria. But there's also the concern about frequent small shortages. We, we'd also found that to be an unacceptable um, reliability scenario. <laughs> Any questions about reliability? Director Wong, had, I thought you had some questions earlier on before the meeting. Right, so can you just define reliability for me? I mean, more than 10% shortfall, what does that mean? Does that mean we'll make it up from conservation? So do a more, help me understand what it is. Certain. So right now we're having a 15% conservation. What does that equate to? Very topical. Uh, so if we can suspend the 15% reality at the moment. Okay. So a 10% shortfall means when we look at our availability, we look at our demand for water and we look at the availability of our imported supply, and I'm stacking these up here. Okay. And we have our San Francisco water and our state water, maybe some other water supply, and we have our local resources, and we want these to match, right, in a normal year. Right. The 10% shortfall means this stack of water supplies is falling 10% short of that demand. So if we had a 50 MGD annual demand rate, we would be short 5 million gallons per day of, of water supply, and we would have to make it up with emergency conservation, such as we're doing right now. Uh, as you know, we are going for a 15% uh, uh, conservation metric, somewhat influenced by direction from the governor of the state of California, but also somewhat commensurate with what that stack of available supply looks like for ACWD this year. So, so I guess when I was reviewing the slides, what confused me a little bit is, so are you assuming demand? When you calculate shortfall, is the difference between supply and demand? So when you're... <laughs> When you are talking about demand, mm -hmm. you're talking about a average year, normal year demand. Correct. Because demand obviously will go down in a drought, then your Correct. calculation would be different. Correct. Correct. So we're just assuming normal year, 10% shortfall. 10% short. Yeah. And in application, forgetting governor's orders, mm -hmm. in application, what a 10% shortfall would mean is we would say we're short 10%. How are we going to close the gap? We would either go out and find new supplies in an emergency. Okay such as a transfer, which we've done in the past, or failing that, we would turn to our water shortage contingency plan and say, we have a 10% shortfall. Here are the measures we're going to enact to, to make sure that demand and supply okay. match this year. Okay, 
Got it. Is it helpful? Yes, it does. Okay. I just want to make sure that it's not 10% shortfall based on drought demand, which means no. conservation, you can't conserve your way out of it. No, no. Okay. In fact, we don't Thank assume you. conservation going into a drought other than what is asked for. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on this one before we move on? Okay. Uh, and I left some notes about the 2019 workshop. Very topical, of course, is governor's executive orders. Uh, and we will have to discuss how we want to handle those moving forward. We talked about it a lot in 2019, uh, and we have seen the state where agencies have built drought-proof supplies, uh, ocean desalination, and they've been still mandated to cut back on use of those supplies. It adds a new dimension, um, but we're not getting into that tonight. Let's assume pre-executive order. Uh, the next metric uh, is another topical one, water quality. Uh, so to be clear, the IRP requires that we meet all mandatory water quality goals. But establish an objective around secondary water quality, which uh, um, is a, I believe is an EPA term, is actual primary and secondary. Uh, we typically refer to it, we planners who don't understand water chemistry very well, refer to it as aesthetic water quality standards. Um, so the objectives were to avoid sudden changes in water taste or appearance and to maximize health related quality. This mostly was in application was about the disparity in the aesthetic water quality of hardness. As we know, um, we have several sources of supply and, and uh, about 40 years ago, this agency had areas that were served purely off of San Francisco and other ones that had softened groundwater. And there's a lot of variation in water quality through the system and this board has given direction for the district to try and achieve more parity and uh, uh, sort of equality of these standards throughout the system and so that's really been the driver for our hardness goals as well as reducing demand on raw groundwater so that we can uh, reduce the hardness at our blender facility so the metric was maximum monthly hardness during a drought we wanted to make sure that we didn't compromise water quality even during drought periods. Um, okay. And the can details I, on this got just variable by scenario. Real quick, sir. Director Honestly, Zeddy. I don't think that a lot of people in our community today understand how varied the, the quality of the water was in terms of taste and hardness um, years back. But I distinctly remember, mm -hmm. you know, you could go to somebody's home in a different part of the community and the water would taste very different. We also had the big battle over citizens' utility um, in Niles and, and Union City, uh, where the uh, water quality was extremely poor, and the citizens petitioned ACWD a number of times to acquire citizens' utility. We also acquired some smaller uh, water utilities in the area as well. So it took a long time to bring on desal, which helped balance out our water to we, we had the water softening plant which was the world's largest down at Maori Peralta um, we we had uh, uh, a number of things that we did over the years that I think people should understand you know our mission is to deliver good high quality water but just in recent decades we were we were not there so I can see the 1995 um, plan that prior board worked on, uh, including, I believe, Director Gunther and Weed, um, <clears throat> where that was a very important issue. And we shouldn't take it for granted. Those are my comments. Uh, well received, too. Yeah, I think if we were to piece together this sort of implementation of, we've put together in our, our publication, the 19 uh, reliability by design report, where we tried to show really a lot of the tangible benefits of water quality, uh, excuse me, of uh, districts performance under integrated planning and water quality was definitely one, but I think a nice story could be put together showing what things used to look like compared to how they look today. It's a good point. Um, but may I move on? Okay, so again, this is a, if we look under those objectives, our director of operations over there maximize health related quality. So this is a place where these policy objectives trickle through into other plans. They're actively managing taste and odor up at TP2. 
So we lean on these objectives here to uh, not just to go into main planning documents, but give guidance as we see variations in water quality and, and need to make enhancements along the way. So this one, we want to just acknowledge that um, this category has changed, uh, as this part knows very well, the ability to measure and detect constituents in water has gotten very good. And uh, with that has come broadening understandings of what water quality means as well as recommendations. And we'll be talking about this a bit more next week, uh, but we wanna acknowledge that bottom bullet maximize health related quality is still a guiding element in the district's planning policies for what actions we take here at ACWD. We've introduced this notification level topic and we'll we'll talk more about that next week, but that clearly falls under under a water quality policy objective and how we want to handle things like that. Uh, our next uh, criteria was environmental impacts. And for those of you who looked ahead at the uh, the exercise, you'll notice that we leave this one off and I'll explain why. Uh, environmental impacts was a uh, uh, policy objective of to avoid or mitigate. So what that meant in application was if a water supply project or development would have an unmitigable or permanent environmental impact, it was considered sort of a, a fatal flaw. It would not be pursued. Um, and part of that is kind of today, this, this topic has morphed more towards what we call implementability. The notion is if you're, if you're proposing to build a project that has significant environmental impacts, you're facing a significant challenge through CEQA law, you may not be able to build this. So what's, what's the value of looking at something that it may take you 10 years to get to a place that somewhat predictably might say you, you can't finish the project? That was how this was used in 1995. And again, we not more, more commonly would call this implementability nowadays. Um, and then also a metric of protecting groundwater resources. The IRP as part of its objectives really did uh, embrace expanding the use of Niles Cone, uh, as this board knows very well, and put a lot of put a lot of money into getting more use of the Niles Cone, and, and wisely so. We're benefiting from it today. So the reason why we're going to drop this off the assignment is that this was used as a fatal flaw. It, it was a pass fail. Either something had um, serious environmental impacts and was of concern enough to say we just won't even consider it or it did not. So we're leaving it off of the exercise for tonight. Any questions about uh, this metric? Okay. Uh, Director Weed, I'm assuming you're following us okay online? I am. I've been unusually quiet, but uh, I'll let you finish your presentation. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, uh, for allowing me to continue. Uh, objective, uh, the next is local control. And this to me is a big one uh, in the history of ACWD. The policy objective was to maximize district control of resources and to avoid chronic shortages. I want to pause here for a moment. Let's do avoided chronic shortages. Well, we talked about reliability. So why is avoid chronic shortages here? I got to say, I don't really know. But you'll see when you do this exercise, if you haven't thought through it, these things begin to sort of touch on each other. Um, some things can fall into multiple buckets and we can blur the lines and there's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, is it's a sort of a continuum in planning. It's not very discrete, discrete slices. Um, so maximizing local control of resources, um, this involved as a detail was to limit the number of entities involved in developing or acquiring the resource. So we didn't want to have to share our resources with too many people. If you think about it, we share everything. With State Water Project, there's 27 other member agencies. Locally, we have to share the South Bay Aqueduct, Lake Del Val operations with Zone 7, Valley Water. All these things take a lot of coordination. You juxtapose that to a single source agency like historically San Francisco with the Hetch Hetchy system. They owned and operated the whole system, right? We're not in that world. We don't own our entire water system. So if we can limit the number of other entities we have to engage with, that should lead towards better control for our own portfolio. Um, so in addition, the firmness of a water right or an allocation, how, how reliable would something be? Um, 
quantity that is shared with others, and then whether state or federal agencies were involved. And uh, so, as I mentioned, it was unclear to me why avoid shortages was put in here. It feels duplicative to me. I haven't found anything to explain or seen how it was used in addition to reliability. But why I like this one, and, and Director Sethi is a historian on the board, I'm sure you'll appreciate. In 1995, the board had just gotten out of the 87 to 92 drought. It still remains the drought of record for the state of California for water supply planning. We almost lost the Delta to salt intrusion, almost completely lost it as a freshwater conveyance system. And we were looking at the emergence of the CalFed Bay Delta program, which is where I spent a lot of my early years working on. Uh, and what was that was the state and the federal government coming together to figure out the Delta once and for all, right? We were going to get that done. Uh, and it brought all the stakeholder interest groups to the table as well. Um, and this board had spent 20 years investing in the state water project and had a lot of expectations about what it could do or would be doing and realized a very hard lesson during this drought. And um, at that time realized we need to establish more local control and minimize our risk and our exposure to uncertainty that's introduced by all of these outside entities. Obviously, we stayed very well invested in the state water project um, and substantially, um, but we just want to mitigate that risk. And now we're touching on the risk topic a bit here by building that local control. So to me, risk and local control largely for our application means the same thing around here. But this was also a very wise move that led to this integrated planning philosophy in the 1990s. Any questions on this? Okay, I will point out by the criteria that was used, ordinal scoring, sort of this was considered high, medium, low. Is that a lot of local control or poor local control? So that's what that means by ordinal scores. And our last category, I believe it's the last, is risk. Um, minimizing risk due to future uncertainties. Again, this was ordinal scoring, and it focused on three subcategories of finance, water supply, and water quality. And the detail in there, I think, really says it all. Um, what's the likelihood of having to spend more money than expected, i.e., if you have a big upfront capital cost on a project that you later can't get a benefit from, you have a stranded asset, and you have this financial uncertainty that you've introduced. Um, the vulnerability uh, to future water quality regulations, um, contaminants of emerging concern, and then vulnerability of a supply to external legal or regulatory changes. Again, think of the CalFed process coming in. Great uncertainty when you get the state and the federal government together, they're going to solve everything. So the, those uncertainties were definitely off-putting. So that's categorically the three um, pillars of how risk was considered at the time. We add to that uh, this board during the 2019 uh, IRP workshops, we, we introduced, this gets under being adaptable. Part of the 2019 workshops, uh, we were discussing planning moving forward and decision making, and we wanted to um, consider some interim objectives. So we said, what are some additional objectives this board would uh, agree to consider for, for decision making as we evaluate new supplies? Uh, I was very happy to have unanimous support from all of you on these two topics. First was climate readiness. And this was, if we're gonna be pursuing something new, a new supply or, or, or water supply, well, I use the word scheme because it's used in technical language. It sounds, I know it's got a bad connotation, but just a water supply scheme is a, a plan. Um, one, is it going to be susceptible or will it be robust against climate change? We don't know what climate change is going to do, but we know certain things like sea level rise and changes in extremes. Uh, would a new measure be vulnerable to that sort of change or not? And second was the topic of resiliency. And this specifically separates reliability is do you have water supply? Resiliency is your ability to withstand uh, emergencies and or bounce back from an emergency such as earthquake. This last topic has taken a tremendous amount of attention lately, so we wanted to make sure we pull it out separately from reliability. Those are, they're both ours. They sound very similar. One's water supply, reliability. The other is the ability to withstand a crisis. Now, admittedly, these are just categories of risk. They're just uncertainties, 
I don't know what climate change is going to do, and I don't know when the earthquake is going to happen. So planning around these things is just risk mitigation. And arguably, when we move forward, we can think of these things as just broadening the definitions under risk. If I can just interrupt with the question. Please. So the resiliency point, uh, especially resiliency against any kind of seismic activity, how was that factored into the 95 IRP? Was that under the risk category? Because I didn't see it listed there. So I'm just curious. It was not. Okay. <laughs> there was really no, there may have been some comment about vulnerabilities. Um, so it may have been broadly covered in risk, but the notion of delta collapse from an earthquake uh, was just not really um, um, anything that I have found in the record as being a, a, as leading of a concern as it is these days. So those were the, the objectives that were established in 1995. And so we want to pursue an exercise tonight. We've asked the board, and I think everybody's had a chance to look ahead of time at the materials, and we'll run over the exercise here momentarily. But we want to get the board thinking about, at your personal level, which of these criteria, and we're dropping out environmental tonight, by the way, not that we don't care about the environmental, but because it's that pass-fail criteria. Which one of these, at a personal level, and with your understanding, do you feel is is uh, would get your vote for sort of more uh, importance than the other topics? So the exercise that we've scoped out here for tonight is 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 a is a, a little taste of some of the work this board will be doing in earnest uh, as we develop the new plan. Uh, we'll hopefully be bringing on a consultant to do this work for us and, and have a guided process, including uh, getting public input from stakeholder groups, as well as surveys to help the board form its opinion based on the community's input of what the community is valuing. Um, so we will be doing this to establish the objectives for the new report. But again, we wanted to just sort of push the board a little bit to be thinking about these things and see if we could get that that base weight before we start the diet program. So that as we go through it, we can kind of compare how we move forward to sort of where we're where we're feeling we are at least at least initially. Uh, and I know you haven't seen real data, you haven't seen projects, you don't know how things weigh into these things. It's really just a a, a feel level of uh, assessment at this point. So um, with that, uh, are there any any more questions about these these objectives that uh, I just reviewed? I think we had some good questions, clarifying questions along the way. A comment. Reliability and risk. I think Dr. Bari had raised a concern about that too. It almost seems that risk is a sub a subcategory of reliability in my mind. And so um, is there a broad and you just had a slide or two on risk? Could you make a comment as to how we distinguish those two? And why risk is sure. warrants a separate uh, equal weight category? Absolutely, uh, and thank you for asking because this is tr this is where these little tricky factors come in. Uh, I'm trying to make eye contact with you through the camera. Uh, I'm going to go back to the risk slide here. I, I'll give you one example. This board, uh, we did a presentation a few years ago. I presented to this board about sites reservoir. Sites Reservoir is a proposed reservoir north of the Delta. I think everyone's familiar with the proposal. Sites Reservoir promises to uh, deliver a fair amount of water uh, that is picked up from surplus flows on the Sacramento River. And so when we looked at that reservoir, we could take the published reliability data from that reservoir. Let's say it was would promise 10,000 acre feet a year on average delivery to ACWD. And we could look at that and say, that's a good number. And they could give us the range of what's the minimum in a drought. Maybe it's 5,000 and maybe up to 15 in a wet period. And that would be our reliability. What we expect the reliable water supply or the yield of sites reservoir program to give for us. So that's reliability. Now, when we enter the risk category for sites reservoir, some of the risk concerns we had came down to this, what is the likelihood of this actually being able to deliver what they propose that they can deliver? We're north of the Delta, so we're vulnerable to Delta outages. We're vulnerable to, uh, to transfer windows and agreements to move that water through the Delta. The 
water was uh, subject to challenge by environmental communities. So the water that was being promised as a reliable supply had outstanding environmental challenges to it, which I believe is right here as well. That's not really external legal or regulatory changes. So, so we considered sites reservoir, while it looks good as a water supply reliability project, to be risky. And when we looked at the cost of the investment in that, uh, we collectively, um, I don't remember the exact record, but as I recall, we were pretty unanimous that we would pass on that. Instead, uh, continue to look at Los Vaqueros being south of the Delta, being positively connected to ACWD, so it was not subject to disruptions of Delta and conveyance and transfer windows. Um, still plenty of risks, uh, but some of the major ones that we saw with Sites Reservoir, Los Vaqueros did not have. Um, so does that example help clarify the difference between risk and reliability? And that's a question President for Director Weed. You're on mute. I'm still left with the feeling that risk really rolls under reliability under the right and fits well underneath the reliability uh, element. The 75% public benefit requirement by the uh, Water Commission for sites was clearly part of the uh, risk element there, the lack of conveyance, um, a variety of issues. So um, it's, and then the timeline, the site's just gonna be a long-term project as is Los Vaqueros. So um, personally, I will be ranking the two of them as a unit risk and reliability as, in my mind, a um, basically is a, a weighted element in their, in their own right, uh, as a joint weighted element. So thank you. Uh, uh, that's certainly an option here when we go into it. But uh, Director Weed, you just nailed right what I've been saying. These things I keep coming back to my hands. I know my little sort of yin and yang here, but they, they all touch on each other. It's sometimes it's hard to delineate one versus the other. Um, okay, should should I continue? Any other questions at this moment? Right. So, so let's move on to the actual exercise. And and I will share that uh, part of the fun of doing this has been we've all learned a tremendous amount about Brown Act and things how to conduct an exercise in a public meeting. <laughs> So it's been an educational process for many of us. Um, so I do have a little thing I need to make sure to read um, after we go through the exercise instructions itself. So what the instructions were, and everyone has a sheet, uh, is that correct? Okay, great. Um, so we've laid out the, um, really the, the five primary weight, uh, weighting objectives, and we're asking the board to assign weights, points to those different categories, such that they all add up to 100. And the idea is there's no right or wrong answers to any of this. Um, what the idea is just to see where the board, whether there's a, a range of thoughts about certain categories or if there's some consistency in thinking. Um, but by weighting these objectives, it can give us a sense of, of where the feelings are for the board, if nothing else for right now. So those points should add up to a total of 100. If they don't, I'll scale them. Don't worry if your math's a little off and I won't. I won't reveal anybody whose math doesn't add up to 100. I promise. Um, I'll take care of that. It's really not a problem. Uh, and again, as we mentioned, environmental impact is not on here because it was really a pass-fail item uh, in the 1995 IRP. So, um, so before we move on to actually just doing the work, I uh, just wanted to kind of read this to make sure we get all this point across. So this exercise was designed to gather input from the board today, and we will be sharing the board uh, member scores at a different workshop to inform discussions. Uh, Director Weed, since you are participating remotely, uh, please email your scores to Gina Marcoux before the end of tonight's meeting. If you have the form available, you can fill it out, or you could even take a picture of it and email that if that's easier. Or you can just type out an email with each objective and your assigned point scores. Uh, did did you hear the instructions, Director Weed? 
I did. I'm trying to think. Uh, the phone text may be my best shot since I have the one computer can link and trying to email something in here is a challenge. I can actually what I can do is under the chat is put my numbers in under chat and I'm going to send it to the board. Would that be appropriate? Um, it would go to yeah. every, that would go to everyone. Sure, you don't have a problem with. Sure, uh, it will all be it'll all be eventually sort of public information. It's not um, the idea, though, is is hoping hoping uh, members of the the board will not be um, chatting and and conferring. We want to just get everybody's individual sort of sincere feelings, so we can kind of put it together. And it's just it's just meant to be a fun exercise for us to use as we move forward. Uh, this is open to members of the public as well. Uh, further, any members of the public that are online, um, the scoring sheet is available in tonight's presentation materials that are posted on the district's website. If you'd like to share your scores with us, you're welcome to do so by turning them in during tonight's meeting in person, if you were here, or by emailing them before the end of tonight's meeting to Gina Marcou, whose email is listed at the top of the meeting agenda. You can either send us a picture of your score sheet or email your scores directly in the body of an email. Please note there is no obligation to do this. If, you, if we do receive scores from multiple members of the public, we would plan to share them out only in aggregate in a future presentation, but we do not, excuse me, but we do want to make you aware that if you choose to send us your scores, they would become a public record. Right. So having read that statement, um, I did want to share one thing. Oh, we didn't get it on here. There we are. Uh, one, one little hint. If you have trouble getting started, um, it sometimes it helps to rank things. If you think something's priority one, you know, make a note one, two, three, four, and then come back and put weighting on it. And it's perfectly okay to put equal weights on things. And did we cue the Jeopardy music, Gina? <laughs> Darn, I came up with the 110% solution. I love it. <laughs> No, no extra points for early submission. Like Ooh, no. Extra credit. Double check your work. Wait, you just say there's no wrong answer. <laughs> Thanks for getting out early. <laughs> I'm curious if if uh, staff took a crack at this as well. We'll just talk about that after. Oh, sure. Okay. <clears throat> what was the question? The question was uh, from Director Akbari. I'm curious if staff took a crack at this as well. Good question. We actually thought we're here at the start of the process and it would be best to not influence the results in any way and let let the board do it first. So we'll be happy to share if, if we think you got it wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, all look is, is everybody done here. Y'all look like you're either deep in thought or, or bored and waiting to move on. I can't tell. All right. We're all good. Director Weed, have you uh, finished the exercise? Yep, let's send in. Right. right. And Gina, I think I'm frozen here. All right, there we go. Great. Uh, so, Gina, you'll confirm you received it. Okay, great. 
Uh, so thank you. I hope that was enjoyable. I hope it got the juices flowing a little bit. Um, so what are the next steps? So we'll, we'll collect this data tonight and you'll see it come back. Uh, we'll be using it in, in upcoming workshops, hopefully next week. Um, we do have a workshop on the 16th. Uh, we're going to review a few key things. One would be to present uh, the preliminary results, the draft results for the purified water feasibility, feasibility evaluation study. Uh, that's the indirect potable and direct potable reuse evaluation. And then we'll re review uh, this pre-workshop exercise results. And then we will be discussing uh, priorities and expectations for the 2025 Water Resources Master Plan update, uh, sort of the kickoff to, um, to the actual process. And in 2023, we will be having additional workshops, um, a series of discussions for that continued development of the 2025 plan. If and I could uh, make a uh, summary comment on, um, on one area of uh, reliability slash risk. Certainly. One of the concerns I've had, maybe the IRP is the way to address it, is our contingency operations planning. And we need to come up with some quantifiable objectives in that, in that effort. It's not really its processes and contingency. It's difficult to use the word plan because you don't know quite what the results are going to be. But it strikes me we should be evaluating a process where we, if we were to lose one or more of our main water supplies for a six month period or longer, that we would have some idea how we would be able to continue our operations. We have the luxury of having a great deal of over uh, on paper, twice the capacity of our demand, but we, the way we operate, it's, um, we basically take use of everything. But if we were to lose our groundwater basin due to um, water quality issues uh, before the MCLs are established, or lose the Delta, or lose one of our major water supplies that are imported, it may well easily be six months before they recover. And how do we operate? And have we given any real thought to how we would do that? And I've not heard those thoughts yet. So um, I would throw that out in your IRP as something to consider. Certainly. And, and we have done those for the Delta scenario, but we haven't done them for all supplies. Uh, but we've certainly done the Delta outage um, scenarios. Um, and that again, based on risk um, probability, the uh, the uh, risk assessment is the deltas are most our, our weakest link. But uh, very uh, noted, it's a very good bridge gap when we we and what's useful, Director Weed, is how you defined it as a six month period. That does fall into an IRP type planning. It's not a, a, a necessarily an emergency response planning as much as. Uh, assessing the vulnerability to loss of a supply for an extended period of time, that really falls into IRP planning for sure. Right. And so I, thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other comments? And I have or everybody pass down their worksheets this way. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Nizar. I want to thank you uh, personally for all of your efforts uh, on this. I know you have put years into um, researching, uh, analyzing, trying to formulate opinion that is very helpful to this board and district. And it's, I think your contributions have been invaluable. Well, you're definitely going to leave a legacy at some point here with the district because this will be the guiding light for a couple of decades. So uh, with that, we will move on to item 6.4, general manager's reports, drought update. Great, thank you. We have our first item is drought update and that'll be provided by Laura Hydes, our director of water resources. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. And tonight is a very short drought update. Um, and so we'll just go straight into the next slide. 
The, I'll share a bit about the current status. State remains in severe drought. That's not a surprise. Um, there's no new information uh, related to our San Francisco or, or Department of Water Resources state project supplies, still at the same status. Um, local supplies, we are continuing to look similar to last year. I'm happy to report after the storm, RD3 has been back up and diverting water. Um, rain, if you're interested, this season to date is 2.7 inches. And this last storm, Monday and Tuesday, which was uh, quite, a, quite a good one, uh, was 1.79 inches. So we're, we're glad to see the rainy season start. We're also uh, wanna be mindful that just because it's raining, the drought is not over. And so we're going to continue um, doing a fair amount of messaging along those lines, uh, because as you're aware, our sustain keeping that customer response at the 15% goal that we're looking to to achieve is going to be critically important to continuing to meet our drought targets. And a big, huge shout out to our customers who are still really doing a great job. So we will be continuing public outreach and water use efficiency activities through the winter as well. Uh, just recently with November, we're now down to one day of watering every other week uh, is what's allowable under the ordinance, November through February. So next slide, please. This is just a quick look at our water demands. And you can see at the end of October, we were right there at our target um, at about 36.4 MGD which is about 17% reduction compared to 2020. So we're still on track, um, meaning our goal. And November to date is not on the graph here, but um, we are coming in so far slightly below the, the target for the month. And so that's the balance of the very brief drought update today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. No questions, but I'll just make a comment. Um, you know, I, I actually got a couple of questions over the last few days from members of the public on, uh, well, are we out of the drought? You know, it's raining. Are, are we good to go? Um, and so I know that that messaging will certainly need to be uh, combated. Um, and I know, you know, Director Huang and I sit on the LICA committee, so we get uh, monthly updates on drought messaging. So I just know that in that committee, we'll be really interested to see um, how that messaging is is um, being reflected in overall demand. Um, so I just wanted to add that comment because, uh, you know, we've already started getting those questions and I'm sure that's only going to ramp up. Uh, but hopefully, uh, hopefully our, our customers will, will stay on track and I, I'm glad to see the progress that we're making. Great. Well, thank you. And I did forget to mention that's one thing we are going to be refreshing our messaging now that it's raining. Um, to reflect that. And one quick factoid, if you want to be able to share with the public, is that over the past three years, we're at a deficit of about one full year of rain. So in order to catch up, more or less, we need about two times the normal rainfall. And in the past 140 years, we've only seen that level of rainfall in three years. So um, that hopefully helps put in perspective a little bit that we're still in the drought, but we'll We'll craft some things like that that will help put things in perspective that hopefully we can all share with the public um, to remind them to please keep saving even during winter time when it's raining. Thank you, Ms. Sidis. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Stevenson, do you want to move on to item 6.4.2? Sure. Yeah, this is uh, the title here is Potential Acquisition of Conservation Easements on the N3 Ranch. And this is a bit of a report out. Um, but also an opportunity to seek some guidance from the board and the board's reaction. But I wanted to report on a recent discussion involving staff, uh, together with President Weed and Director Huang and Bill Brown, who's the owner of the N3 Ranch property and his consultant team. Uh, Mr. Brown is very aware of the district's prior interest in acquiring some or all of the N3 Ranch property and was interested in understanding the district's um, uh, interest in whether we might want to work with him on measures to protect and preserve the ranch and its water resources. Mr. Brown expressed his intent to retain ownership of the property. Um, however, he says he's open to other potential approaches that may be of interest to him and to the district. And understanding the district's interest in preserving and protecting the watershed, Mr. Brown had invited the district to discuss 
acquiring conservation easements from him to ensure the property is protected into perpetuity. Such an easement could preclude other potential uses of the property, which may or may not include some level of development of housing or other land development, solar farms, wind farms, vineyards, or water-related facilities and other uses. Just a quick refresher on conservation easements. This type of easement is a perpetual interest in real property that restricts the owner of the land and is binding on successive owners. And the purpose of these easements, and I'm, I'm quoting from civil code here, is to retain land in its natural, scenic, historical, agricultural, forested, or open space condition. So the landowner, and that would be Mr. Brown in this case, retains all interest in the land that are not prohibited by the easement or the law. And the easement holder, and that would be ACWD in this case, can enforce the terms of the easement and can seek injunctive relief to prohibit violation of those terms of that easement. So also as a reminder to the board, uh, our own assessment of the development potential on the property is pretty low. Uh, and of course, any development or use of the property, including its water resources, would need to comply with existing laws and ordinances that govern land use and the established rights to water and other resources that are held by others. So the purpose of this item is to make sure that the board is fully informed about that discussion and also seek guidance from the board as to whether it would like to engage in discussions over such an acquisition. If the board gives direction to pursue the potential acquisition of these conservation easements, then we would arrange for the board to appoint agency negotiators and to convene into closed session to receive direction on a potential price in terms of payment. And if the board's not interested, would of course let Mr. Brown know about that and he can proceed uh, with his plans for the use of the property. So I'd be happy to address questions, but certainly seeking any uh, guidance from the board in terms of uh, whether you are interested in pursuing the conservation easement suggestion. Mr. Stevenson, in managing this uh, discussion, I would like to first hear from President Weed and Director Wong, since they were present at the meeting, as to their impressions and their feedback to the rest of us. President Wee, do you want to start? All right. Um, I asked the question if the property in its entirety remained under the Williamson Act. And I'm told as of now it does. That gives a 10 year um, restriction on any development. So the timeline is not imminent. Second, we, the information we had was incredibly preliminary. No, no definition or discussion of what his proposals and development plans might be. Personally, I strongly support the long term that the ultimate acquisition of the property for water supply purposes to be owned by and in, in fee title by ACWD. I would hope that whatever we do, we would have options to purchase or acquire that property in its entirety to protect our long-term water supply. And um, it was a tragic failure of governance so we didn't do it earlier, but then that opportunity may raise again. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. So, Director Wong. So it was an interesting meeting. Uh, Mr. Brown definitely was very open and in our discussion, he indicated that he's definitely very willing to work with ACWD, but the conversation was kind of interesting. It was very open-ended. We thought he would have come to us with a concept of what he wants to do. We actually started out with he asking us, what do you want? <laughs> Which is kind of a very open-ended question. But then when I, I guess I have a slightly different take than Director Wee in terms of opportunity. I asked outright, are you telling me you're unwilling to sell a portion of the property and that you want to retain the ownership of 
the entire N3 ranch? And the answer back from Mr. Brown is yes, he has no interest in selling any portion of the property. All he's willing to discuss with us is, I guess, the easement. That that's all he's open to discussion with us, but he definitely is very open in terms of very eager to work with us. But I am also wondering what's the ultimate end game and what is the benefit to ACWD in this whole discussion? Um, I walk away from the discussion as in he only wants to talk easement and that definitely was not within what at least I perceive what would benefit ACWD. So, so that's my personal opinion is that if all we're talking about is buying a right to easement, um, to protect the land from development based on what we have learned the potential development potential for the N3 ranch property. I would not, without seeing more information, I would not support going forward with it. So you're asking for my opinion. That's my opinion right now. If all we're talking about is an easement and there's no timing urgency as in as what director we has indicated i am definitely leaning on that perhaps this is not the right time to have that discussion and and i i would have your manager correct me i think i reflected our discussion fairly accurately yeah i don't, I, I think that's correct that's and the last part is personal opinion that you're asking me for so Director Gunther, do you have any thoughts? Well, I guess I'm not a big fan. Um, I, I mean, I guess the question really then becomes is, are we gonna get, does he want us to pay for a conservation easement for the entire range? What piece, um, what, what benefit? I mean, granted, we get this quote non-development issue, but a lot of this isn't even in our watershed. I'm not 100% sure what he wants, other than you get maybe us to pay for part of the ranch and not pay for part of the ranch. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of paying him money to not develop not try to develop something because it's it's going to be quite difficult to develop. And then the question becomes is, you know, is this the west side of the ranch? Is this the um, area in the San Francisco watershed? Is it you know, what who's whose watershed are we even talking about here? Because we shouldn't be certainly paying for a conservation easement um, alone anyway. Not to develop this. Maybe he should contact the state. Anyway, uh, my sentiments are very, very similar. Um, I don't really see too much of a benefit right now for just acquiring a conservation easement. I was going to actually make a similar comment that maybe he should talk to the state. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that I see a whole lot of value being derived for customers with just a conservation easement. Um, and the timing, I, I, there's really no urgency, I think, on, on our end. So that's, those are my thoughts. I, um, I likewise have reservations about um, any potential acquisition of a conservation easement. I... You know, previously in proposing purchase of the ranch, I and I think we had agreement among some board members that um, there was the uh, strong opportunity to set up our own conservation easement and then sell credits into that easement. But as I understand the proposal from the owner here, 
this conservation easement uh, will not allow us to uh, resell any credits. We have no subsidiary rights to um, sell our own credits onto the easement. So um, I'm reluctant to enter into anything like this. I consider it more like paying protection money for for our watershed, um, which I'm not too enamored with. I do have some ideas as to some other things that we may propose to the owner. Um, and what I would like to see is uh, this come back to the board in uh, December and and um, have us at least appoint some negotiators on behalf of the district and board to enter into talks with the the owner to explore some other possibilities. Um, Let me, if, is, that a, is that a fair uh, request, Mr. Stevenson? Yeah, if, well, I, I did hear uh, President Weed starting to chime in, but to answer your question, if the board collectively would like to um, agendize an item to consider some other type of, of acquisition of property interests, we could do that in December. Um, and uh, the the board could appoint agency negotiators at that time, and we could um, we could and, and I'll ask our general counsel to, to uh, chime in where I get this wrong, but I that that is a path we could take. I I would um, I would like to share some of the ideas I have, uh, but I feel like if I do, I would be openly. Uh, negotiating with the, the owner of the property. That's why I want to have this in closed session. So I'm happy to clarify. So what we have on the agenda tonight is what we understood was the property owner's proposal to us is, is ACWD interested in acquiring some sort of conservation easement? Um, and so that is actually what's on the agenda tonight. And what we would need to do and first in December is we would need to have an open session discussion about if it's potentially discussing with um, the property owner something other than conservation easements. The board needs to make a decision on does it want to pursue those types of property interests? And that needs to be done in open session. But then we could concurrently put on an open session item, designate real property negotiators, and then have a closed session I think we're gonna need more information from the property owner because one of the requirements for going into closed session for real property negotiations is we have to identify the parcels of property, the specific parcels of property that are subject to the negotiations because you can only go into closed session for real property negotiations for price in terms of payment. Technically, you can't go into closed session on the question of whether the district is interested in pursuing whatever property interests those are. So that's what would need to be the scope of the open session item if we were gonna do that in December, if the majority of the board wanted to, wanted to continue discussions with uh, the property owner. Okay. Um, I have uh, already shared with the general manager a couple of the ideas that I had. Um, would it be better if we left those for next month? Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, uh, so I, I it, well, the problem is, um, well, you know, we could we could put something on the agenda that's a little bit more broad as an agenda item title, have a discussion next month about specific ideas um, uh, that are within the context of that agenda item, uh, and then decide whether or not the board wants to appoint an agency negotiator. Does that sound okay, Pat? I um, am reluctant to uh, say anything in a public board meeting right now as to the ideas I have, but I would like the opportunity to talk with our general counsel and with our general manager ahead of a meeting next month. But if I could get concurrence from the board um, to
to have this agendized for next month. I would appreciate that. I haven't said anything. I, I probably won't be able to even be at the next board meeting and may not even be able to zoom in. Um, my, I have a wedding to attend back in the East Coast the following day. Um, and did not realize this was just like a couple days ago. Um, so I probably can't be in attendance in December. I don't know if that makes an impact or not. I mean, if we could push it to January, that's fine. I don't, I don't think know. it really matters because we're yeah. just trying to move the ball forward a little bit. I, I um, think it, perhaps moving it later would, because my impression from the meeting is that Mr. Brown is unwilling to discuss anything other than a easement. So if we want to explore options other than an easement, perhaps instead of having an open board discussion, can we, so Pat, you have to help me out. Can we ask Mr. Brown, is he even open to that other discussion? Actually, if I can add on to that question, because that kind of feeds into, into my question. At, one, at what point do we need to appoint an, uh, a negotiator on behalf of the board? Because you know, right now the GM is still able to have open conversations with the property owner, but because we haven't gotten to a point where we've identified those specific parcels, do we need to appoint uh, an agency designated negotiator or can we hunt a little bit on that? Yes, yeah, so you certainly can't appoint an agency negotiator tonight because it's not on the agenda. Right. Um, and there was no need when I was talking with the general manager about how to structure this agenda item based on the meeting that you had, um, this is what we came up with um, based on that discussions. The background of this is the property owner reached out to, I believe, Director Weed <laughs> and said, hey, I want to meet, um, and then contacted the general manager. And we didn't know what it was about. So we said, let's meet. And that's totally appropriate. And it was only two directors. It wasn't a committee. It wasn't directed at the board. It was the idea of the general manager to have two directors to get board input at that meeting. Um, there's no reason why another meeting couldn't be had because the proposal that he put on the table, based on what I heard, uh, there was no interest for the board to pursue that further. But there may be an interest to talk about something else. And the question is, is the property owner interested in that? And I think it's appropriate for your general manager and the two directors, if they would want to participate, to have an, another meeting with uh, Mr. Brown to say, are you interested in this? And, and that would be how we would, based on that, is how we would structure the agenda. And, um, and the board can decide if it wants to go forward. And only if the board wants to go forward does it need to think about appointing negotiators, because if you're not going to go forward, there's no reason to talk about price in terms of payment. And that would be the only reason you could go into closed session. <clears throat> Mr. Miyake, why don't we go on, on your guidance here? And um, <clears throat> uh, we could entertain that, that subsequent meeting with Mr. Brown in December. Let this roll over to January as an agenda item, if it, if it uh, merits that. That sounds right. Totally appropriate. That's what the board wants to do, and I'd be supportive of that as well. Okay, I'm supportive. A quick comment. Um, I, I keep emphasizing the potential for water supply. We're going to have a discussion on a parallel discussion on Delval Reservoir, which may or may not impact the um, portions of the N3 Ranch. And I would hope that as we look at what our water supply opportunities are, we can develop them without the constraints that we currently are facing with a visitor center park in the bottom of the reservoir and a um, and the recognition that uh, the watershed is an important element of that, particularly for, for, for flood control capacity. So it's better to talk to a, to a project concept than it is the very vague um, presentation that we had in this discussion with Mr. Brown and um, Director Wong and I, as well as our key staff. And therefore, let us not lose the opportunity of 
enhancing our water supply, particularly recalling we just looked at reliability as being probably our primary issue as a district. Any other? Well, I think that gives staff what we need. So we'll go back and give it a little bit of thought and start planning on um, a further item uh, to the board and um, some additional discussion with Mr. Brown. And uh, we'll coordinate with uh, Directors Wong and Director Weed on that. And uh, we'll have more to share uh, in the near future. All right, well, that does complete our uh, general manager's reports for this evening. Okay, we'll go on to directors, comments, reports, et cetera. Make a request sure. for like a five minute break if possible. Sure. Yes, let's take a quick break. 7.45, we'll be back in a few minutes. Would you like to start off with your trip uh, to AWWA? Yes, um, John Weed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Humer Wolk and I were able to attend the AWWA conference. We saw um, Steve Dennis there as well, former chair of that chapter and former director of AWWA. I, there were a number of sessions, particularly related to water quality. Um, and I had an opportunity to be sitting in Dr. Wolf, and I had an opportunity to sit in on a ad hoc session led by Dr. <clears throat> Dimely, who is chair of the AWWA Water Quality Committee, uh, Chad Seidel, a uh, president of Corona Engineers out of Colorado and then several other members on the phone. And the topic was PFAS and the risk coming out down the road on PFAS. Um, the um, second area was microplastics. It was pointed out that if we're uh, in both cases, both um, organic fluorine and microplastics, that laboratory requirements are extraordinarily expensive and limited currently. So suggested for total organic chlorine, we will consider sending the samples to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. In the case of microplastics, that we look at building a clean room for our laboratory, new facility. So this is all evolving Another aspect of this was the legal issues that while you have an MCL, we're generally protected. There's legal protection for water agencies that meet the minimum contaminant levels because we're not health agencies. We don't establish those. But where the MCL has not been established, there's no clear guidance as to what the level of contaminants are and what the responsibility of the districts should be. So these are questions we need to review, review. and I encourage uh, attendance at AWWA meetings. They um, get to the very basic core of one of our, our services, what we do and why we do it. So, thank you. Okay, um, Director Weed, would you like to continue with, uh, well, let me start here, got everything out. So 7.2 is our joint report on the Water Education Foundation San Joaquin River Restoration Tour that Director Weed and I went on last week. And uh, uh, it's a little bit of background. Uh, this is a $1.2 billion project uh, where the efforts are aimed at restoring flows to a 60 mile mostly dry stretch of the San Joaquin River to revive Chinook salmon runs while reducing or avoiding adverse water supply impacts to farmers and also minimizing flood control problems. So 
we traveled along 100 miles of the San Joaquin River from Friant Dam, Millerton Lake, all the way to our final stop the second day at the uh, confluence of the, of the uh, San Joaquin with the Merced River coming out of Yosemite. That was uh, quite interesting. There is so much to report on here. I could go on for an hour, but I will not. I have put out a very large map on the table in the back. You have to flip it over, but it shows, um, this is not a straight river. You know, it's a long and winding river. Um, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin are the two longest, but uh, the in various areas, the channel of the San Joaquin River is, I'm just estimating, it's anywhere from two times in the smaller areas to up to 10 times as wide as the Alameda Creek Channel and, and, and mostly dry. So you can tell what a mighty river it once was. I will give you the highlight of three things that I thought or really, this is an incredible tour. It's the first time they've held it. Um, and I highly recommend it in the future if they, re if they redo it. Um, I had Mr. Stevenson pass out the list of uh, all the attendees, the speakers, um, the itinerary, uh, so you can see who was speaking on what subjects. I was at the Mendota pool here, I think for the fourth time, and I still find that to be one of the most fascinating uh, areas of water in the state of California. Delta Mendota goes from the Delta down to Mendota. And uh, the Mendota pool is receiving water from San Luis Reservoir from the, um, from both the federal system, the state system, and the San Joaquin River when it's running. So it's a very interesting distribution point where uh, water is going in all different directions. And uh, San Luis, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, San Luis Mendota Water Management Authority is one of our partners on, on uh, Los Fiqueros Reservoir. They're on the board and they are not just a beneficiary. They are a paying member uh, like we are into the project because that reservoir will become important for future water supply. Uh, we visited SAC Dam, which is uh, a, another incredible engineering facility you have water that is being received above the San Joaquin River in its own canal coming from Mendota, running parallel to the San Joaquin River. And then where this dam is, they're diverting water into a T section into another canal. So you've got three different levels of waterworks there. Um, the river, the senior dam, and then another canal. Uh, that's in, in the middle going in a T-section. And in order to help the fish out, they have to build this humongous fish ladder around Sac Dam. And they are building two fish ladders. One is for the salmon because they jump. And then they have uh, another more shallow and gradual uh, uh, ladder which is for the non-jumping fish. So it's two huge uh, fish ladders going in and they are building a fish screen right there that is going to be 350 feet in length. That's more than the length of a football field, 350 feet for a fish screen. Um, one of the most fascinating water facilities I've ever seen. We also uh, saw the Coachella flood control bypass that they've been working on. 
And the reason this huge bypass is there is because if the San Joaquin River has its natural flow, it will flood out all the small towns and cities that are around there. So they've had to build this massive um, um, miles long uh, diversion, uh, which is called the Coachella Flood Control Bypass. John and I were with, with our the other attendees, we were at one of the um, the berm structures where the fish cannot get over what's there. They're going to remove that at some point. Uh, actually, they're going to build up a rock bed like we have in Alameda Creek so the fish can get up and over that berm. But we saw most of the river was dry. There was one pool of water there from when water was running in the spring and hundreds of dead salmon right below because um, they couldn't get over. So uh, that was real interesting. And being at the confluence of the Merced and San Joaquin Rivers was uh, uh, a wonderful sight. Uh, I was kicking around the dirt around there and came up with a few uh, Indian Flintstone heads and, and clamshells. Um, I brought one back. I was asked to leave them at, at the site. Also wanted to mention one other thing. You meet some of the most interesting people on these tours. And uh, here we are talking about our watershed tonight up at the N3 Ranch. But um, I had a conversation with a gentleman who works for Merced Irrigation District, and they have a separate parks and recreation division in their water district because they are managing tens of thousands of acres of watershed and uh, reservoirs. For the cost of just a nominal fee, you can spend nights and weekends up at their lake facilities in these brand new cabins um, that go anywhere from 100 to 150 a night. But they are uh, fully furnished, uh, furnished and everything. And uh, I was surprised at the amount of um, recreational activities they offer for fishing, hunting, outdoor activities and things like that. Anyway, an incredible tour. Um, I hope everybody maybe go on it someday. Water Education Foundation does a fantastic job. Oh, and we had a wonderful dinner in Los Panos at the Wool Growers Basque Restaurant. So that's my report. Director Weed. Yes, well, I was a chaperone for uh, Director Sethi's ex excursion, but um, it is an incredibly complex system, to, and the ability and the effort to bring the fish back into a river that had essentially not flown or flowed for a number of years, um, better part of a hundred years, is been a, is a major task and a very expensive one. I was astounded at the complexity of the canals, bypasses and bypasses of bypasses as they have a system which has to take care of the current low flows and some major floodwaters at times. It ties to the uh, Los Banos grasslands um, system as, as part of that discharge effort and ultimately to the Delta. So, the challenges are remarkable. It's well worth trying to get a, just to, to visit it, you get a sense of the complexity of the effort involved. And- I wanna uh, add one, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. I, I wanted to mention one thing, which I was talking to Director Gunther about yesterday. Um, <clears throat> When we were at the confluence of the Merced and San Joaquin, 
um, we were informed that coastal steelhead trout comes, you know, all the way down from the Delta and goes up the Stanislaus River, the Tuolumne, and the Merced, but they do not go past that, that confluence right there. They do not go up the San Joaquin River. It's really interesting that uh, their sense of smell, it's like they have these exits on the highway <laughs> that they're taking, but they won't follow the main river all the way up into the Sierras. Can't explain it. Okay, thank you. But this will be a work in process for a number of years. It has federal Bureau, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, state and um, local uh, agencies involved. There's another com complicating factor is the subsidence. The subsidence is of up to six inches a year in some places. And you work on, they find themselves working on projects and suddenly find that the design is, um, it's changed because of the topography has changed. So, thank you. If uh, any of you are interested, I highly recommend reading a biography on Henry Miller, who was actually ger German, came over penniless to this country and ended up being the largest landowner in the United States. He owned 1.2 million acres of land at uh, the height of his uh, industrious efforts they said you could ride from the border of Oregon all the way down to Mexico and never leave a, a piece of his property. And so much of the Central Valley uh, uh, has a, a history around uh, Henry Miller and one of our guides who still owns a farm there, one of the more interesting aspects of the tour is a direct descendant of Henry Miller. So he was able to share some of the stories and everything. Fascinating. And uh, I would like to mention two other, let's see, I've got a couple of other reports. On Monday, I attended the uh, Special District Leadership Foundation workshop on problem solving for the modern leader down at Seaside. Um, this was taught by a member of Best Best and Krieger law firm, very inspiring, and it was on critical thinking and creative thinking skills to solve problems at your district. So I am going to be employing some of those techniques that I, I learned. Uh, lastly, I have a book and I see that Megan Marino is on a member of our public and water district employee who is on the um, book club for the district. And I highly recommend to anyone who wants to read this, The Worth of Water by Gary White, who's a professional engineer, water and wastewater, and the actor um, Matt Damon. And they are the co-founders of water.org. And it is a fascinating journey about all of their efforts in the developing countries of the world to bring in clean water and sanitation. And uh, after investigating water.org, I decided I'm going to be a fundraiser, uh, work on one fundraising activity for them this next year, uh, focused around the Water Awareness Month. So um, definitely a, a good and quick read. The Worth of Water, and I would recommend it to our book club. And the last thing I wanted to share, in case anybody's interested, while we were out in the valley coming back, we went to the castle, the decommissioned Castle Air Force Base, Castle Air Force Base, and went to this uh, extraordinary outdoor air museum covering many, many football fields in size. I had the greatest uh, docent guiding me through there, retired Colonel John Weed, <laughs> <laughs> who knew every detail about every plane that was on the field. And so I got a real uh, lesson on the way back home and the indoor museum was uh, 
quite interesting as well. I'm hoping to make a return visit. If you go down to Yosemite, go west from Merced. But if you go east into Atwater, uh, they have signs for the museum. Uh, wonderful place to, to go. Anyway, those are all my reports. Any other director reports? No? Uh, anything else from the general manager? That's it for this evening. Item eight is adjournment. Okay, we will adjourn at 8.18.